Right, so good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in to this CPDME webinar. It's great to see so many people are here tonight. Um, I was quite impressed at the number of people interested in clinical examination. So thank you for giving up your evening to tune into this. And thank you for the CPDME team um, for inviting me back to talk to you about clinical examination. Um, so hopefully we should have a good 45 minutes or so uh, discussing this topic, and I, I hope you find it useful. So hello, my name's Chris. Um, I'm a GP trainee in the north of England. Um, and most importantly, this is Maggie the dog, who makes an appearance on all of my webinars. So you can go back and you can watch them and you can see photos of her doing various things. So this is her enjoying spring, um, like I'm sure all of us are doing at the moment, enjoying those longer, longer days, uh, which is feels like winter is lifting. Um, so I'm always happy to answer any questions after this, after the webinar. So this is my email address. Or if you want, you can add me on LinkedIn. Um, not the coolest social media platform, but <laughs> but anyway, so you can scan that QR code if you want, and um, you, that will take you to my LinkedIn profile if you want to add me on there and talk about anything to do with clinical education, which is which is what I'm interested in. So as Andrew has already mentioned, tonight we're going to be thinking about um, the neurological examination of the upper and the lower limb. Okay, so that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. And there's a previous webinar, which you can watch on the CPDME website, where we talk about the cranial nerve examination. And I've separated these because when we're teaching these skills and assessing these skills, we tend to separate them, don't we? So we teach a cranial nerve examination, we teach an upper limb neurological examination, and we teach a, a lower limb neurological examination. So we do tend to separate them. But as I'm sure all of you are clinicians will know that in, in real life, we, we tend to do bits of each exam at once or we assess a patient in one go. So the separation between these neurological examinations is a bit artificial, but it, it makes it easier for teaching and learning. And I'm sure there are many students listening to this um, when we assess these exams in an OSCE setting, then this is how we assess them. We ask you to perform an examination of the upper or lower limb, etc. So that's what we're going to do. So the plan for tonight is we're just going to do a crash course in neurological examination of the upper and the lower limb. This isn't going to be an exhaustive how-to procedural guide. I'm not going to break down every single step and go through it because firstly, that would take a long time. And secondly, doing that, doing that over a webinar isn't the most engaging. So what I would suggest is alongside this webinar is take a look at some of the great resources available on YouTube. There are some really good clinical skills videos, many of which have patients with real clinical signs. So I would suggest watching one of those videos from the likes of Geeky Medics um, alongside this webinar. Um, and I will signpost to a, a few videos as we as we go through. And the other thing that's obviously really useful is is practicing this in real life and reflecting on your clinical examination encounters. Um, so that's just a, a bit of a health warning. We're not going to be covering each minor step. Um, we're going to take a more broad overview of examining the upper and lower limbs. And my suggestion is if there's something that you're not sure about, um, you can obviously ask a question at the end, but it's always useful to have a, maybe a pen and a paper and you can scribble down any terms that you're not familiar with and you can research them after the webinar. Good. So what are we testing when we test, um, when we perform a, a limb examination? So we're, we can break the neurological examination down into several components. So we're obviously testing the motor system. Um, so... For example, you know, when the patient, if we're asking them to move their arm or we're testing the movement in their arm, we're testing a whole series of motor pathways that start in the primary motor cortex, travel down our descending motor pathways. You might have heard of the pyramidal tracts, the corticospinal tract, it crosses over, goes down the spinal cord and goes to your arm. So we're testing that motor system. We also test reflexes, so the, the muscle stretch reflex. We're testing the patient's sensory system. So there we're, we're talking about kind of ascending spinal pathways. And we're, we also test a bit of coordination. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. 
So I've, I've reflected a bit on examination skills since doing all of these clinical examination webinars. And I've come up with this, uh, this model, which maybe I should patent and publish. Um, I just dreamt this up the other day. So I was thinking about clinical examination and everyone listening to this will be at a different stage in their clinical examination journey. So for example, you may be a healthcare student and you haven't really examined many people, you haven't seen much pathology. Or at the other end of the spectrum, you may be a, a world leading professor and in a specific subject and you've seen thousands of patients and done thousands of examinations. So we can think of examination as a, tri a triangle and it's and at the bottom of the triangle, there are lots of people performing examinations. So, for example, a neurological examination, the general public perform this when they're asked to do a fast test when they call call an ambulance for someone they think is having a stroke. Um, and then as you move up the competencies in medicine, so maybe you, you gain some extra skills, your, the level of com complexity of your examination increases, and all of us are somewhere on this pyramid. Um, and at different levels of expertise, you're going to perform the examination in different depths, and that's okay. So the depth we're going to aim for in this session is roughly what I would teach maybe a a third or a fourth year medical student. And this is what I've, I've based the materials off. Anyway, that's just my ramblings about examination, um, which I, I find quite interesting. So why is the neurological examination important? Um, well, I'm not a neurologist, they're very smart, um, <laughs> but they will tell you that most neurological problems can be diagnosed from the history and clinical examination alone. Um, before you look at the MRI of their head or spinal cord. And knowledge of neuroanatomy helps us localize the lesion. And this is a term you will hear in neurology. So the idea of this is we can roughly work out whereabouts in the nervous system the problem is based on the history and signs the patient is presenting with. And if you're ever posed with a, with a patient kind of presenting with a, a neurological presenting complaint, it's always worth thinking of these kind of four questions. So is there a neuro neurological problem? You know, where is the lesion or the lesions? Is there a recognizable pattern? And what are the differential diagnoses? So this is just a useful way to think about patients presenting with neurological problems. So a bit of a health warning. Um, we're not going to spend much of this webinar talking about neuroanatomy and localizing the lesion, et cetera, um, because it gets very complicated very quickly. But there's one thing I would really like to just spend a couple of minutes explaining and talking about. Firstly, because it's useful in clinical practice. But secondly, because this, if you're in an OSCE, this is the sort of thing that crops up in an OSCE. So it's always good to know this stuff. And that is the difference between um, what we call an upper motor neuron lesion and a lower motor neuron lesion. Or you might see them called um, upper motor neuron syndromes and lower motor neuron syndromes. And these have different clinical signs. So, so what do we mean by this? So let's cover some basic neuroanatomy. So our voluntary kind of motor system is a two neuron pathway. This is a gross oversimplification, by the way, in case there are any world leading neurologists listening to this, I apologize, but this is how I remember things. So it's a two neuron system. So your upper motor neuron kind of originates in your primary motor cortex. So this is the bit of your brain that controls your voluntary movement. So when you decide you want to move your arm, you know, it's your primary motor cortex that's kind of initiating that decision. The impulse then travels from the primary motor cortex. Um, it crosses over in the medulla and then it travels down the spinal cord um, and then it terminates in the in a segment of the spinal cord, the anterior horn of the spinal cord. And everything above the anterior horn, we kind of refer to as the as upper motor neuron. In the anterior horn of the of the spinal cord, another nerve, another neuron emerges and takes that signal from the spinal cord mm. to the muscle. And that's kind of the, the end stage of the journey of this nerve impulse from your primary motor cortex, okay? So it's a two neuron system. So upper motor neuron is primary motor cortex to anterior horn cell of the spinal cord. 
lower motor neuron is from the spinal cord to the muscle, okay? So that's the first thing to kind of, kind of get right in your head. The, the voluntary motor system is a two neuron system and all upper motor neuron, all upper motor neurons exert their effect via a lower motor neuron. And the other important thing to understand is that upper motor neurons can all, also have a role in inhibiting lower motor neurons. So not only are they telling your arm to move when you kind of think that your arm needs to move, but they also play a role in suppressing lower motor neurons and preventing, for example, muscle spasm and involuntary contractions. So they play an inhibitory effect as well. Okay, so we know that the, the kind of voluntary motor system, we've got these upper motor neurons, which are kind of in the central nervous system, and we've got these lower motor neurons, which are going from the spinal cord to the muscle. So if you've got a problem in an upper motor neuron, that's going to give you a different set of clinical signs to a lower motor neuron problem. And this is a classic exam question, OSCE question. This is also a spot diagnosis. So you get a different collection of clinical signs. And for those of you that have done this before, you might be already thinking about some of the, the different clinical signs that you get. So if you have an upper motor neuron problem, so this is a problem in the brain or in the spinal cord, and the most simple example to use is someone that's had a stroke, then you get weakness, obviously. All of these kind of problems present with weakness. So you get weakness, but you also get, remember we said upper motor neurons play an inhibitory role on lower motor neurons. And you've severed that inhibition because there's a problem in the brain or a problem in the spinal cord. So therefore these patients present with increased tone. Um, they can have spasticity and they can also have brisk reflexes because they've lost that inhibitory effect um, that comes from the upper motor neurons. So they have hypertonia and hyperreflexia. And if you test their planter response, which we're gonna talk about later on, then they have upgoing planters or a positive Babinski sign. Um, and all of these signs put together suggest an upper motor neuron problem. And you, you might be wondering, you know, why, why do they have reflexes if, if the nerves are damaged? Well, because the lower motor neuron is still intact. So there's nothing wrong with the lower motor neuron connecting the muscle to the spinal cord. That's okay. The problem is higher up. And these patients, they will get atrophy of the muscles over time. They will get disuse atrophy, but it won't be as pronounced as patients with a lower motor neuron problem. So in a lower motor neuron problem, the problem isn't in the brain or the spinal cord. It's after the anterior horn cell. So an example of this is if you've got compression of the peripheral nerves. So a classic example of this is cord requiner syndrome. Remember kind of after the end of your spinal cord, you've got this, this filament, these filaments of nerves look like a horse's tail um, and they can get compressed by all sorts of nastiness such as a large disc prolapse. Um, and that's a problem with the peripheral nerves. So in a lower motor neuron problem, um, you de-innovate the muscle itself. You've completely cut off its, its nerve supply. So you get wasting, you get fasciculations, and fasciculations are visible contractions of a, a muscle unit. Um, we've all had fasciculations, like your eyebrow twitching when you're really tired. Um, so you might see fasciculations. You have decreased tone and limbs are flaccid and weak. Patients will have reduced or absent reflexes because that reflex arc, which we'll cover later on, it has been cut or de-innovated. And you might have absent planters or normal planters. And these patients, the muscles will very quickly atrophy. There will be, um, because the, the muscle has been cut off from all nerve supply. So this is the difference between an upper motor neuron problem and a lower motor neuron problem. The only caveat to this um, is in the acute setting, um, upper motor neuron problems um, can initially present with more flaccid weakness. Um, so it takes time for these upper motor neuron signs to develop. So for example, if you're working in the emergency department and you're seeing patients who've just had a stroke, 
they're probably not going to display um, all of this spastic hemiplegia and weakness straight away. But if you're working in a community stroke unit, rehabilitating these patients for weeks and months, then that there you're more likely to see the upper motor neuron kind of syndrome, as it were. So this is something that is worth getting your head around because a lot of the neurological examination is kind of aimed at thinking, is this an upper or lower motor neuron problem? Okay, so hopefully I haven't bored you with, how long have we got? We've talked for a while, 10 minutes of neuroanatomy. Um, so let's, let's get into this. So a simple structure to examining the limbs. So I like this mnemonic and I was taught this mnemonic at medical school, which was Cardiff. And I'm not sure where this mnemonic comes from. I've never heard anyone else use it. But the one I use is, is the physician really so cool? And I still use this today. I kind of mutter it under my breath. Now, you could substitute anything of this in this mnemonic. So I don't know. If you're a physiotherapist, you could switch physician for physiotherapist. It doesn't really matter. But I really like this because the neurological examination can seem complicated, overwhelming. And in an OSCE setting, it's really easy to get to the end of your examination station and realize you've forgotten to check the reflexes. OK, I've certainly done that and many students have done that. So if you have a structure like this, it will help you not to forget anything. So what we're going to do is we will go through this structure for the upper limb and the lower limb. Right, so let's start with the upper limb. I just thought that made more sense in my head. So the first thing we start off by is just general inspection. And that's inspecting the patient. Um, and we can gain lots of clues to their neurological problem just by looking at them. In a hospital setting, there are obviously lots of clues around the bedside. Uh, but even in, a, in an out of hospital setting, there will, there will be clues and just simple things like, do they have a walking aid? Do they have a nil by mouth sign? Or do they have an obvious neurological problem like a, a facial droop um, or a hemiparesis? Or are they using a, a wheelchair to mobilize? So these are really simple things. And if you are doing an OSCE or an examination, it's really important that you pick up on these and note them um, because it, it's such a crucial part of our examination. And any of you that are doing remote consultations at the moment in COVID times will know how difficult it is when you lose the ability just to look at your patient. Um, it provides so much information. So the things that obviously you're looking for is you might look for muscle wasting. We've talked about that. We, you might look for fasciculations. We've talked about that. A lower motor neuron sign. The patient might have a tremor. And, and this could give you a lot of information about the potential diagnoses. And there are a couple of spot diagnoses you might come across. So they might have a, a tremor suggestive of Parkinson's disease, which is normally a rest tremor. It's normally unilateral. It's described as a pill rolling tremor um, affecting the upper limb more than the lower limb. Or they might have other forms of involuntary movements, um, such as Huntington's career, uh, which are more kind of unpredict unpredictable rapid involuntary movements affecting the, the upper the, the limbs. So they may have some involuntary movements or a tremor which give the diagnosis away. And I quite like this mnemonic SWIFT um, just for um, a set of things just to mentally check off in your head that you're looking for. Um, so you're looking for scars, wasting, involuntary movements, fasciculations and a tremor. Good. So good inspection, always a good way to start an examination. So tone, so that's the next part of our upper limb examination. And at this point, you might want to test for something called pronator drift, although uh, you, you might do this elsewhere in the examination, depending on what structure you're using. But I tend to do it at the beginning, um, otherwise I forget it. So pronator drift is where you ask the patient to kind of place their arms out in front of them with their palms facing upwards, and ask the patient to hold their arms there and, and close their eyes. And pronator drift um, is quite good. It can detect a more subtle upper motor neuron lesion. And I've got a photo to show you of, of what a, a drift looks like in, on the next slide. And then when you're assessing tone formally, it might be obvious from visual just inspection that the tone is increased, but a more formal assessment would involve 
asking the patient to fully relax their arm. You can support their forearm, check their tone at the wrist, just as if you're shaking their hand, and you can pronate and supinate the forearm. And you can also test tone at the shoulder as well. And remember, we've already talked about a very flaccid weakness with reduced tone suggests a lower motor neuron problem. Although in practice, it's quite hard to, to pick that up. Um, you can have spasticity, which is said to be velocity dependent. So the faster you try and move the limb, the worse the spasticity and the increased tone is. Or there might be rigidity, which is said to be velocity independent. So it doesn't matter how fast you, you move their limb, the um, kind of the rigidity is constant. And then you can get more specific clinical signs suggestive of the underlying diagnosis. And you can go away and look these up if you want. So for example, things like cogwheel rigidity, which is where you've got um, rigidity and a Parkinsonism tremor at the same time. So the combination of tremor and rigidity means that it's like turning the wheels of a cog um, when, you, at, when you check tone at the wrist. Um, so these are some findings that you might find when you're assessing tone. And I've just got a photo here um, of an example of pronator drift. So we can see on the right hand side, um, the kind of the arm has drifted down and there's a bit of elbow flexion and forearm pronation. And that's because if you've got an upper motor neuron problem, then the, the flexors and the pronators are, are relatively spared. So they're stronger um, than the extensors and the supinators. So you get this, this drifting of the arm. So this is pronator drift. So remember, subtle sign of an upper motor neuron problem, an upper motor neuron problem. Um, good. So remember, we're just moving through our, our mnemonic. So um, we've done inspection, we've done tone. Now we need to move on to power. So this is where my health warning at the beginning, I'm not going to go through how to test every um, component of kind of power in the upper limb and the lower limb. So go away and have a look at some clinical skills videos for these. And the most important thing is you need to provide clear instructions to the patient. And you need to try and isolate the joint as much as possible. But the clear instructions to the patient is really important. So there's some good examples in the Geeky Medics videos. They're quite good. Um, and if you've ever tried to do this in real life, then sometimes sometimes it just goes wrong, doesn't it? And patients don't really um, know what you're talking about. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to test the, the myotomes. Um, so different, show, different movements um, will be a different kind of set of muscles um, controlled by a single spinal nerve root. And that's what a myotome is. So it's a group of muscles innovated by a single spinal root. Um, so, so I don't know, an, an example is, I don't know if this is, anatomically correct, but if you think of it, everyone knows the saying, you know, C3, C4, C5, keep the diaphragm alive. So we know that the diaphragm is innervated by a nerve, the phrenic nerve arising from C3, C4, and C5. So those are the nerve roots of, of kind of the diaphragm and the phrenic nerve. So here we're testing different spinal nerve roots. So when we, for example, test shoulder abduction, when it's more C5 that we're testing, whereas when we test shoulder adduction, it's more C6, C7. So you need to work through methodically. So shoulder, elbow, wrist, and fingers. And different patterns of weakness can suggest different kind of localizations for spinal cord pathology, okay? So this is useful to help you maybe try and work out at which level the, the pathology or the, the damage has occurred. Um, so, as I've said, it, it's really important to so test one, one side at a time. You, you need to kind of support and stabilize the joint. You need to provide clear instructions. Um, so the classic one, you know, bend, bend your elbows and stick your arms out to the side like a chicken. Now don't let me push you down. So these, these clear instructions to patients that they can understand. And then you can grade the power in the, in the limb for each individual movement, or you can make a kind of a gross estimation of the power in the whole of the limb using the MRC kind of power grading scale, which you might have come across um, if you've started learning neurological examination. And the idea of this is it's, it's quite an old tool. I think it was developed during um, the Second World War, I think, 
And it was designed to try and standardize um, muscle power grading. And you can read the kind of the grading system there um, for yourself. But the, the problem with it is it's quite subjective. And the majority of the patients are going to be four or five. So there's a big difference between four and five. Um, and it can be the, the, it can be difficult. Sometimes patients are nearly normal and you might see people write four plus, um, but it starts to get very complicated. But this is the kind of the best system we've got um, for kind of trying to standardize how we describe the power in a limb. But it is very subjective and it and kind of does depend on your own power as well and how hard you're pushing down on their limb. But this is, um, this is kind of the best system we've got. So hopefully you've worked through methodically, you have um, tested the power in each of the kind of the muscle groups in the upper limb, um, which is good. And you know which kind of nerve roots that you're testing when you do that. So now we need to move on to thinking about reflexes, everyone's favorite. So I found this great diagram and um, which kind of illustrates what a reflex is. So really what, what we're testing is a muscle stretch reflex. And a reflex is an involuntary unlearned action to, to a specific stimulus. So in this case, it's the muscle stretching. And the key thing about a reflex is that it, it doesn't require input from the brain, okay? So that explains why in upper motor neuron problems, you know, when maybe there isn't input from the brain, um, a reflex is preserved and is actually exaggerated. So the basic principle is that if you stretch a muscle, it contracts, that's what we're testing. Um, and this is what we test with a reflex hammer. So we, we kind of hit a tendon, and we, which stretches the muscle, and that causes a contraction. That's essentially what, what we're testing when we, when we test for a reflex. Um, you can do this on yourself, uh, it's quite hard. It's easier for maybe someone else to do it. Um, you can test reflexes on your pet if you wish. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, this is not, not something that is unique to humans. You, you could go try this on your dog if you really wanted. But so the reflexes provide us with information and it can help us distinguish, is this an upper motor neuron problem? Is this a lower motor neuron problem? And the different reflexes, um, they are associated with different spinal nerve roots again. Uh, because the muscle that you're testing is innervated by different spinal nerve roots. So biceps and brachioradialis are C5 and C6, and then the triceps is C7. And the thing with reflexes is that the limb needs to be really relaxed, okay? You have to try and get the patient to relax, which can be quite difficult when you're kind of coming at them with a tendon hammer and you're dressed in full PPE, probably quite scary. Um, you need to hold the tendon hammer at the end. That's a very common mistake. I didn't, I don't have, yeah, I don't have one around me, but you, you hold it at the end and you, you use gravity to help swing the hammer. And you can try grading the reflex, although it's not very standardized and I, I don't really like doing it. It's much easier just to describe your findings. So was the reflex absent? Was the reflex present? Was it a brisk reflex? Um, and was there clonus present, which is more related to the lower limb. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the lower limb. So you can try some reinforcement if, the, if you can't elicit the reflex. So this um, involves, you can get them to clench their teeth, or if you're doing the lower limb, you can get them to grip their hands together, okay. So reflexes require a bit of practice. Um, and I would suggest once again, having a look at some clinical skills videos, but really the best way is to buy yourself a, a tent, a reflex hammer. You can, you can probably, I think you can get them really, you know, the really cheap generic ones, probably only a couple of pounds on eBay. Um, and the best way is to practice. So obviously we're not allowed to leave our houses at the moment, but post lockdown, you know, when you meet up with all your friends, you can ask them, can I test your reflexes? And you can just go around and test everyone's reflexes. It's, it's the best way to learn the skill um, is just by practicing it. Good, so we've, we've done our reflexes. So we've done inspection, power, reflexes. Now we need to move on to thinking about sensation, okay? So sensation involves knowledge of some dermatomes. Now, it's, dermatomes are kind of 
the thing in medicine that make most medical students want to cry and hide because it, it is quite complicated and it and it kind of involves lots of memorization of numbers on different parts of the body but essentially a dermatome is the a strip of skin that's innervated by a single spinal nerve root and once again knowledge of um, dermatomes helps us localize a lesion at a particular spinal cord level and information regarding sensation is transmitted to the brain by two different, two main kind of ascending spinal cord tracts. So you've got your dorsal columns and you've got your spinothalamic tract. And this is something that I would recommend if you're interested, go, go and look this up. Go and look up ascending sensory pathways of the spinal cord. But essentially different sensory modalities are tested um, are transferred by different the two different tracks so your dorsal columns they um, transmit information regarding light touch proprioception and vibration whereas your spinothalamic tracks although they do do a bit of light touch they, they more do kind of pinprick sensation and pain and they do temperature sensation so two spinal tracks and they um they transmit different mod sensory modalities to the brain. So when you're testing, when you're testing sensation, you're not only are you testing kind of the, the level or you're trying to work out, you know, are all the dermatomes intact? You're also testing the two different spinal cord tracts. And really, so often in an examination or in a formal OSCE setting, you wouldn't need to do all five you would maybe just do light touch, pinprick, and maybe vibration. Um, you wouldn't necessarily, and you might do proprioception as well. So proprioception, by the way, if you're not sure what that is, that's joint position sense. Um, so crudely, it, it kind of, it's how do you know where your joint is in space? Um, so for example, you know, your finger, do you know if it's up or down? It's, it, that's a very crude way of thinking about proprioception. So for the dermatomes, these are the dermatomes of the upper limb. Um, the thing is, is that there is quite a lot of individual variation um, and it's easier to remember dermatomes by two methods. OK, the first easy way to remember dermatomes is just to remember some landmarks. Um, so I've got some silly mnemonics to help you later. Uh, but the other way to remember dermatomes is not to look at them in the anatomical position. So the anatomical position is uh, looking at a diagram of a person stood upright with their hands like this diagram is. So whereas if you flip them, if you move the image of how we look at a person, here we go, and uh, we look at a, a image of dermatomes on someone that's on all fours, then we can see hmm, that the dermatomes make a lot more sense, don't they, when we, <laughs> when we move the human position into this form, which, you know, does kind of strongly suggest that perhaps at one point in our evolutionary history, well, we did, didn't we? We evolved from walking on all fours and the dermatomes seem to make sense when you look at it from this perspective. Um, so this is just an interesting way of thinking about dermatomes. If you're like me and you've struggled to try to pic picture them in your head, then um, this diagram is really helpful about thinking about how the dermatomes are, are structured. Um, so that's really useful if you haven't seen that before. Good, so dermatomes for, for testing them. Um, so for light touch, we, we tend to use a piece of cotton wool, don't we? So we use a, a piece of cotton wool and we, we test it first on the sternum to make sure the patient can feel that. So light touch, we use maybe a piece of cotton wool or gauze or whatever. Um, pinprick sensation, you can use a neuro tip. So for those of you, well, anyone works in primary care and diabetic foot clinic or does diabetic feet checks, we know what a neuro tip is. So it's a small, it's got a little sharp point, but it's, it's not a needle. Um, and you can use that to test pinprick sensation. For vibration sense, then we use a kind of a tuning fork and we place that on a distal bony prominence. For proprioception, you um, move a joint. It's normally the thumb in the upper limb or the, or the big toe in the lower limb and you move it up or you move it down and you ask the patient to close their eyes and can they tell whether their um, kind of thumb or their finger is pointing up or pointing down so there's a great 
example of that, you can go and look at a clinical skills video to see how to test proprioception. And for temperature, we, we don't really routinely test that, although the vibration, um, the tuning forks are usually pretty cold. So you can use that to test whether they can feel the cold or not. Good, so that's how we test sensation. Um, and lastly, coordination. Now, uh, you might not always test this because um, kind of performing an assessment of someone's cerebellar function and um, their kind of their cerebellar, you know, that, that in itself is an examination. Um, but in some places or, you know, in an OSCE, you might test the bits of coordination that are relevant to the upper limb. OK, so the things that immediately come to mind are the kind of the finger nose test. So that's kind of you're looking for pass pointing or dysmetria and you're looking for an intention tremor when as their finger moves towards their nose. And then there's this concept of dystiodokinesia. So that's the inability to perform rapid um, alternating movements. OK, so that's where they, they place a hand out in front of them and then you get them to flip their hand over like this. So these are the parts of the cerebellar coordination assessment which are relevant to the upper limb that you might perform at the end of your examination. But if you're doing that in, in kind of clin clinical practice real life, you would need to think about the other parts of the cerebellar examination. And I quite like the mnemonic Danish. I put in a photo of a Danish pastry, which is making me feel quite hungry. But the other things that you might check for, so such as looking at their gait to see if they're ataxic, um, looking at the eyes to see if there's nystagmus, um, kind of just, just seeing what their voice is like. Um, and in the lower limb, we're going to talk about their heel shin test as well. So we'll talk about that. Good. OK, so we've we've whistled through the upper limb. There we are. This is my medical meme of the presentation. <laughs> I haven't been able to find many um, neurological memes. So uh, this is how I felt as a medical student trying to learn a neurological examination and being able to perform it in eight minutes in an OSCE setting. The concept to me was terrifying. And it, it does feel like that if you're, especially a newer practitioner, um, thinking about this, um, then it, it can seem quite daunting. But when you break it down and when you use the mnemonic, is the physician really so cool? Then it makes it a lot easier. It does make it a lot easier. So you can have a little stretch if you want for 30 seconds and we're gonna move on and we're gonna think about the lower limb. How are we doing for time? Okay, might run over by a few minutes. I hope no one minds. Um, and then let's move on. I've lost my mouse, here we go. Right, okay, so lower limb. So a lot of this we, we've already covered, haven't we? We've already covered the general inspection of the patient and we've already covered kind of those spot diagnoses that will, for example, if they've got a resting tremor or if they've got a, a kind of an, an obvious hemiparesis or they've got obvious upper motor neuron signs. Um, but once again, we, we go through our swift mnemonic. So we might look for muscle wasting fasciculations tremor, et cetera. But the really important thing with the lower limb examination is to assess the patient's gait. And gait will give you a lot of information about neurological pathology, especially in the lower limb. Um, because you're, you're using, you know, you're, you're using lots of muscle groups, you're using proprioception, you're using sensation in order just to walk around. So gait provides lots of information. However, in an examination setting, if you're doing this in an OSCE, you might not have to um, perform this because it takes too long. However, it is a really useful part of the examination. And it's something that we have lost with the switch to remote consultations. Um, certainly, if you're in the emergency department and you're seeing a patient in the waiting room, just watching them walk from the waiting room into the clinic room will give you a lot of information um, about their neurological examination. Um, and so this is lost. So my suggestion is on YouTube, there's some excellent examples of gait abnormalities. So for example, the typical gait of a patient with Parkinson's disease. Um, so they have got reduced arm swing, they've got small shuffling steps. That's kind of the classic gait of a patient with Parkinson's disease. And it's kind of a spot diagnosis. Mm -hmm. 
Or if they've got a cerebellar pathology, then they have this really broad kind of based ataxic gait, kind of look like they're a bit intoxicated. Um, or maybe they've got a high stepping gait, which suggests a foot drop. So there's lots of gait abnormalities um, that you can, you can go and have a look at on YouTube. And I would, I would recommend kind of going and looking at those. So then we move on. So we're just moving through our, our set of um, our kind of our mnemonic. So we move on to tone. So you can kind of test tone at the hip. You can roll the leg, test tone at the knee, rapidly lift the knee. And you can check for clonus as well. So clonus is um, a set of kind of involuntary rhythmic muscular contractions and relaxations that's associated with upper motor neuron problems. And they say that more than five beats of clonus is is kind of abnormal. And the way you test clonus is you kind of, you just ask the patient, you relax, and then you just rapidly dorsiflex the ankle with the kind of foot partially averted. And you're just trying to stretch the gastrocnemius muscle. Um, so that's how you test for clonus. Um, and then once again, we've talked about the difference between um, reduced tone, increased tone, et cetera. But clonus is definitely an, an upper mode, suggests more an upper motor neuron problem. Uh, good. So we, we've tested tone. So then we move on to power. So once again, health warning, have a look at a clinical skills video for the exact kind of phrasing that you would use. Um, but it's really important, try and isolate the joint and then you're testing different nerve roots and you're testing different myotomes. Um, and you, you might find, I didn't mention earlier, that there is some variation between texts. Um, like everything in, in medicine, there's variation. So, you know, the dermatomes aren't as exact as that picture. Um, <laughs> and there'll be a lot of individual variation. In, in the same way, the myotomes, there's some variability. And there's also variability between different sources. So some textbooks might slightly emphasize different nerve roots. Um, but don't worry too much about that but you're testing different myotomes, different nerve roots. When you take the lower limb through the series of movements, so test the hip, you know, flexion, extension, knee, flexion and extension, ankle, and then you can test the big toe as well. Good, so we've done power. And then reflexes, um, the, the main reflexes in the lower limb, well, the, the reflexes that we test are the, there's the knee or the patella, patella reflex or patella tap, um, and then we've got the ankle jerk reflex as well. So we've got the knee being L3 and L4 and the ankle being S1 and S2. Um, and then we can also test the planters. We can look for that Babinski response. So once again, the limb needs to be completely relaxed. So the knee, you've got a couple of options. Um, you can ask the patient to uh, kind of swivel around and hang their leg off the end of the bed so that their leg is hanging. And then you can tap the patella tendon with your tendon hammer. Or the other way, which is kind of what I do, um, is if they're on the bed, um, then you need to take the weight of the knee and slightly bend the knee. So you can place an arm underneath their knee just to relax it and take the weight. And then with your other hand, swing the tendon hammer. So that's how you can test for the patella reflex. And then the ankle reflex is a bit more difficult um, and is probably something that you, you might need to watch a video on. And there's a couple of ways of doing it. Um, kind, of the, the, kind of the proper way is you get them to bend their knee, um, kind of flop it out to the side, and then slightly dorsiflex the foot with one hand, and then with the other hand, tap the Achilles tendon. Uh, it sounds quite complicated, but once you've seen it in practice, it does make sense. Or uh, what you can do is you can do what's called a planter tap, which is actually a lot easier. Um, so it's, uh, it's a lot easier to do this. So this is just where their legs are straight and you place your fingers on the ball of their feet and you just strike your fingers with the tendon hammer and you should see a, a contraction and you should see the ankle plantar flex. So these are the two reflexes that you're going to test in the, in the lower limb. Once again, using your tendon hammer and uh, swinging, swinging the tendon hammer. And then we've, um, we mentioned the Babinski reflex or the, the planter reflex. So I've got a, a couple of pictures here to show you what we're talking about when we talk about this. Um, now, the, the first thing to say is that it's, it's really important that you explain um, to the patient 
what you're going to do. Um, because if anyone's had this done to them, it's quite unpleasant. And if you don't warn them, then it, it could be quite uncomfortable. And if you're in an OSCE setting, then there's no better way to lose lots of marks than not to warn a patient when you do something like this. Um, and therefore, you, so you warn the patient, and then what you do is you need to kind of run a blunt object. Now, we used to use the end of a tendon hammer, but it's pretty sharp, and we don't really use that anymore. Um, I'm sure people have got stories of old school consultants using their keys <laughs> to do this. Not, not very hygienic from an infection control point of view. Um, but basically, you, you, you run an object along the lateral edge of the sole of the foot, and you moving towards the base of the little toe, and then you turn medially and run across the transverse arch of the foot. Um, and then normal result, uh, you should get flexion of the, of the big toe and the other toes. So normal, which you can see up the top here on the diagram, in the flexes. And then in an abnormal kind of um, Babinski response, you get um, kind of extension of the big toe and the other toes spread. Um, and someone's asked, is it normal in babies? So no, so under, under the age of two, then you'll have um, a positive Babinski sign. You'll have upgoing planters. So it's normal under the age of two. I think that's because of, um, I think the, you're testing my neuroanatomy here, but I think it's to do with the formation of the spinal cord tracts. And I don't think they're fully formed when you're under two years old. It's my limited neurology, lim limited kind of knowledge of that. Good. So we have talked about reflexes. We've talked about the knee jerk. We've talked about the, the ankle jerk reflex. Um, so let's kind of sum up the reflexes, okay? Because this is something that comes up. It definitely comes up in exams. It came up in my medical school exams, actually. I remember answering an exam question on the nerve root of the patella reflex. So this is how I like to remember the reflexes, okay? So the way to remember the reflexes is to do a kind of a medical head, shoulder, knees, and toes. Um, and basically count up from your ankles. So your ankles are S1, S2, you move up to your knee, three, four, brachioradialis, five, six, biceps, five, six, triceps, seven. So that's how you remember the reflexes. So you can uh, turn it into a little song. Um, so you just count up from the bottom. So one, two, three, four, five, six, five, six, seven. There we go. Now you can remember the muscle roots or the, the the nerve roots that you're testing with all of your reflexes okay and i still use this every day because if you try and remember it in isolation there's lots of numbers in neurology and dermatomes and mitomes it gets very confusing so this is my very simplified way of remembering the, the reflexes and it's quite effective so we've we've done reflexes um so now we need to think about dermatomes and i've got here the dermatomes of the lower limb. And I'm sure probably quite a lot of you will have come across patients with sensory abnormalities in the lower limb, kind of in the context of back pain and sciatica and radicular pain where there's irritation of a nerve root. Um, and then patients report paresthesia and abnormal sensation in a particular distribution in the lower limb. And you can kind of work out which nerve root it probably is based upon uh, the distribution of the abnormal sensation. So that's kind of a clinically relevant reason why where patients may present with um, abnormal findings that help you think about localizing the lesion. So these are the dermatomes of, of the kind of the lower limb. Right, so just a little thing about dermatomes. So, um, Someone mentioned earlier, how do, we, how do we kind of learn dermatomes? Well, so there's two ways, I think. So the first way, which is what we did at medical school, um, was to draw, <laughs> essentially, or to paint the dermatomes on yourself, or if you have a willing and consenting partner, to kind of paint them on each other. So that's a, quite an effective way of learning the dermatomes. I mean, I remember colouring in my, my upper limb with various spinal nerve roots, etc. So that's one way you can learn the dermatomes. 
but that's probably overkill. And I don't really remember all of the dermatomes by doing that. The, the other thing you can do is just always have a dermatome chart in front of you when you're doing an examination. And I think that's probably very valuable. Um, it's, uh, you know, because we're all kind of human and trying to re recall all of this information is difficult. Um, the other way is to use landmarks and to use silly mnemonics. And I quite like these um, because you, if you can remember some landmarks, then you can kind of fill in the blank. So there's some really silly ones you can use. So for example, C4 doesn't supply the, the arm, it supplies the shoulder. So I remember that because you wouldn't want to pick up C4. So therefore C4 doesn't supply the arms, it's just the shoulders. It's really silly memory. It's a really silly memory aid. Here we go, someone else has put one in the chat. Yeah, there we go. So there's these really silly things that you can, um, you can use to help you remember. So we know, um, you know, we know that T10, belly button, L4 is when you're on all fours. C6, you've, you've fixed it because it's like a thumb. You can say thumbs up, you've fixed it. C7 points to heaven. I'm not going to explain that one. I'll let you work that out for yourself. Uh, T4, teat poor. There's lots of these silly kind of memory aids that you can use. And I think this is quite helpful, actually, um, because if you can recall just these landmarks, then that does give you an idea of thinking about kind of um, thinking about the landmarks. And then you can kind of fill in the rest of the rest of the, the dermatomes as you go from there. And then finally, so coordination. So the, the, the thing we use in the lower limb is the, um, is the heel shin test. So the, the kind of the heel shin test is, is kind of where the, you ask the patient to run, run their heel down their shin. Um, so from their knee to the ankle of their other foot. So they run down the shin and then they bring their leg up and then they do a big circle. Okay, it's the heel shin test. And it's a very gross screening tool looking for ataxia. Once again, you can watch a YouTube video about the, the heel shin test if you're interested, but it's not a very specific sign. It's just a kind of a very gross kind of, um, kind of screening tool for ataxia. So, but you might decide to do that at the end of your, your lower limb examination. And then I put in the Danish picture again. Obviously food was on the mind when I was doing this. How are we doing for time? Um, okay, we're not doing too badly. And in fact, I think I've timed this quite well. So once you've done all of these um, examinations, then you, you need to think about documenting them. And this isn't something that you would do in, a, in an OSCE type setting, but this is perhaps something that you would do, obviously, if you're working on the wards, you're, you're doing this in real life. Now, the, the thing is, is that you know, most areas are moving to electronic recording of documentation. So there's probably now tick boxes that you fill in to say that you've tested reflexes, you've tested sensation, um, you've, you've, you've kind of, you know, what's the power in the upper limb and the lower limb. Uh, but the old school way of doing it is to do something like this, to do a little table. And I remember doing this, in my neurology attachment, <laughs> going, going around the wards and examining lots of patients and basically, you know, writing out these long neurological clarkings but this is what you would maybe do so you can do as a table basically with along the top you've got is it right upper limb left upper limb right lower limb left lower limb so you can abbreviate that and then going down the side in your rows then you put tone power coordination reflexes and then you can also this in this example they they have tested all four of their sensory modalities and this is just a very simple way sorry, excuse me, of communicating your examination findings um, to the next person to, that reads your, you know, reads your documentation. So this is quite useful. Although I appreciate lots of you now will be using, like I said, electronic um, kind of electronic methods and maybe there isn't free, the ability to do this as a free text, but it, but it is quite helpful. Right, so this is just documentation. So this is quite useful. Good. So once you've you've got to the end of your kind of cranial nerve or not sorry your limb examination, then there's other things that you need to think about. So remember we said at the beginning that you're you're if you're examining a patient and you're examining their neurological system, remember you're going to want to do a more comprehensive assessment. So you you are also going to want to include 
their cranial nerve assessment. You are also want to test their mental status, you know, their cognition, etc. And if you're doing the lower limbs, then you would also want to test their gait. Um, so these are the things that you would need to offer to do at the end of your examination. Um, and oh, I did put another medical meme in, didn't I? <laughs> so yeah, if you've forgotten your reflex hammer, then you can use the use your stethoscope, although is a bit more painful. Um, yeah, it is a bit more painful. So my top tips are that YouTube is really good for brilliant signs. And I know I know I've mentioned it quite a lot in this webinar. Um, but the reason for that is, is it is a, such a really good resource because not only can you see normal, so you can watch the Geeky Medics video that shows kind of normal, no pathology, but there's also a really excellent collection of clinical signs on YouTube. So you, you can go and have a look at an ataxic gait. You can have a look at a Parkinsonism and gait. You can look at a Parkinsonism and tremor. Um, you can see what hyperreflexia looks like. So it is worth um having a look at youtube to see the clinical signs practice is really important um and there's a difference between practicing for an oski and practicing for real life but that's something that we just have to accept um, and for those of you that are already examining patients in real life you will know that we don't do it kind of oski style and we more selectively choose which parts of the examination to perform kind of based on our clinical reasoning process and our differential diagnosis um, but practice is obviously really important. So, so go around and test everyone's reflexes. Why not? You know, <laughs> as long as they consent for you to do that. And most of the time it will be normal and that's absolutely fine. Um, but it's useful to, to test all of that. And then don't make it up. That's something else that's really important. Um, so don't make it up and keep clinical relevance in mind. So, you know, there are lots of weird and wonderful tests. Um, but it's also worth at the end of the day wondering how is it going to change your management and the clinical relevance of all of these examination skills. So good resources, obviously Geek Medics, um, McLeod's clinical examination, and then as I've already mentioned, YouTube. So that's about it really. So we've kind of got to the end of our session. Um, so if you've got any questions, I mean, we can answer a couple now, um, although my knowledge of neuroanatomy is, <laughs> don't test me too much. Otherwise, feel free to add me on LinkedIn or send me an email. I don't mind talking about anything to do with clinical education, quite interested in it. So a couple of people messaged me after the last webinar and we talked about cranial nerves and various other things, which was quite useful. So um, yeah, feel free to get in touch. Um, I always like chatting to people about that. And I hope you found it useful. So um, a couple of people saying thanks. And I really appreciate you all tuning in and hopefully you found it useful. So if you're new, new to doing neurological examinations, hopefully you've picked up some basic skills. And if you're already an advanced practitioner, you know, doing this day to day out, hopefully you didn't find it too boring, but we've recapped a, a couple of important points. So yeah, thank you for listening.